Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in this session with the title Pride versus Prejudice, LGBTI people in the EU today. Um, we're talking today about what will shape the EU uh, policies regarding LGBTI issues um, on the EU level and on the national level. And when we're looking at the L EU LGBTI survey results, uh, we're also looking at the EU LGBTIQ strategy from the European Commission and as well the implementation on the national level, both by a government representative and somebody from civil society in Montenegro. Very happy that you're joining us. This is a pre-recorded session, as you might have understood, and um, we will be joining uh, this or we will be followed by a live interactive discussion of 30 minutes and um, after this. So please save all your questions for that moment and we will be hoping to be able to answer that. I will kick it off. My name is Jules van Hoof. I work for uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. I work as a seconded national expert program officer and uh, mostly on the LGBTI survey but also on hate crime and I would like to introduce the people with me today as you can see them already. Um, it's, it's Irena Musova who is director at the European Commission for Equality and Union Citizenship at the Department of Justice. Uh, Costa Gavrilides, advisor to the president of the Republic of Cyprus for issues relating to multiculturalism, acceptance and respect to diversity. And last but not least, Jelena Kolakovic, program director at the NGO Juventus and Montenegro, which is a member of the Joint Action Platform, which is uh, advocating for the rights of LGBTIQ people in Montenegro. Welcome everybody. I will kick it off with my presentation and then give the floor one after the other to the other speakers. So thank you very much. I will be sharing my presentation if all works out. And there we are. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I will be introducing the EU LGBTI survey that FRA conducted in 2019. Um, we uh, published it last year um, and it, this was pre-COVID. This is important to notice because some of the results are um, uh, not taking into account COVID, um, but I will say something about that later on. Uh, a little bit about FRA, the EU Independent Agency for Fundamental Rights. It's the independent center of reference and we promote and protect human rights in the EU. We support member states and the European Commission and um, we also work with local stakeholders to international uh, from local to international level and uh, we do research and we form opinions and we do capacity building and technical assistance to member states as well um, for policy and develop uh, and, and decision makers but also law enforcement and civil society. Uh, I will be talking in my presentation about the survey development, how it came about, um, details on the survey respondents, and uh, I will be making some comparisons between the 2012 survey that we conducted for LGBT people and the 2019 uh, survey, and then I will dive deeper into the 2019 results. And then we have the next slide, if it works. Yes. So who are the respondents? As I said, in 2012, we conducted a survey um, for LGBT people and we had over 93,000 respondents, as you can see the division in the pie chart over in the screen. Um, and in 2019, we repeated the survey. So seven years later, we managed to get almost 140,000 respondents um, from all over the EU, I must say. So all 28 member states at that time before Brexit um, and uh, also from North Macedonia and and Serbia. Um, the survey was um, of course with done with uh, civil society and the European Commission but also with experts from uh, research and academia and we had national survey contact points actually in place who were supporting us with the national rollouts in uh, the different countries uh, with their networks. Um, and as you can see, there is intersex people are new in the 2019 survey. And although the percentage of 1% uh, might seem very small, uh, it is still the largest data set available on intersex people worldwide. And actually the whole survey is the biggest survey of its kind worldwide with so many respondents and a large data set on a number of topics covered uh, in the survey. 
Another difference is that we collected the data for people uh, 15 years and older. So in the previous survey in 2012, we were able to ask people from 18 years and older, but now we were able in 2019 to collect the experiences of young people still in school which is important to notice. Um, and I will explain to you later how you can uh, look into those results into detail, because as you can imagine, I cannot uh, elaborate on the survey um, too much uh, because there's just too much of that. So um, firstly, we compare some results between 2017, 2012 and 2019, uh, and we look at the overall prevalence of discrimination, which you, as you can see, has increased with 6% between 2019 and 2012. And especially when we look at the groups um, in the LGBTI community, uh, LGBT community, of course, because we can't compare with intersex people who were only added in 2019, we see that a, a really in significant increase for trans people from 43% to 60% of people said they encountered experienced discrimination in at least one area of life in the last 12 months. When we look at discrimination at work uh, in the last 12 months, um, actually this is uh, again the trans community for LGB for the LGBT groups suffers the most from discrimination at work. Um, and one out of out of five has experienced is has experienced this is quite high. Um, for most LGBTI groups, the experiences with discrimination at work has not decreased at least over the last seven years, despite all the efforts at EU and national level. Um, in fact, we see this increase for the trans respondents again from 22% to 36% in 2019. Um, we asked the respondents specifically about experiences with work and employment because the explicit mention of sexual orientation and gender identity in two EU dire directives. Um, and this is important to notice because then it's the competence of the EU um, regarding work and employment. Uh, and in our opinions, the Fundamental Rights Agency is calling on the EU to adopt the Equal Treatment Directive, which would ensure that EU legislation offers comprehensive protective protection against discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity and sex characteristic in key areas of life currently not covered by EU legislation. So that would mean a benefit to the rights and equality of LGBTI people. Then zooming in on the results for 2019, um, we've asked the respondents what they think was over the past five, year, five years, if prejudice and intolerance against LGBTI people has increased, stayed the same or decreased in your country. And as you can see where the EU average on the left side of your screen um, uh, shows a particular number, it does not fully reflect the situation in all countries, as you can see at both ends of the table. Um, there are significant differences between countries, so the EU average is something to keep in mind, but to zoom in on the country, um, you can make your own report in an interactive data explorer that we actually have. Um, uh, if you look at the LGBTI community, you see big differences in, amongst those groups as well. And here again, trans and intersex people have uh, the most, have the idea that prejudice and intolerance has increased the most um, of all the groups. So this is um, a result that you can see. For it. So it differs between the countries as well. We've also asked our respondents that over the past five years, if violence has increased uh, or stayed the same or decreased in your country. And again, significant differences between countries where the EU average is 43% of the people, actually almost half says that uh, they think the violence has increased against LGBTI people, which is quite a high number. Um, and again, looking at the LGBTI communities, the trans and intersex people actually have the, uh, the highest reporting of that they think violence has increased. We've asked what the main reasons for the increase in prejudice, intolerance and violence is against LGBTI people. Um, and as you can see, a negative stance and discourse by politicians and or political parties is deemed the main reason for the increase. If people said it was increased, this was the main reason they, they mentioned. Uh, also lack of support by civil society. And um, as you can see, lack of enforcement of existing law and policies. So when you're looking at the policy side, the theme of this workshop, it's important 
important to keep this in mind that actually political parties, politicians, um, civil society and law and policies play an important role in this. Um, but also, you, as you can see, the other reasons were mentioned as well by people. Um, we've also asked people who said, actually, we see a decrease in prejudice, intolerance and violence. Um, what were the reasons for that? So these are the um, the, the the stimulating factors that um, also policymakers can keep in mind. And as you can see, visibility and participation of LGBTI people in everyday life is mentioned by 71% of those people. So 71% thinks this made all the difference for a decrease. So this is important for policymakers to keep in mind. Um, closely followed by support by uh, public figures, community leaders, support by civil society, society and positive changes in law and policy. Again, there we have law and policy playing an important role in the factors in the reasons for decrease um, or increase uh, when it comes to um, intolerance, prejudice and violence against LGBTI people. And of course, we wanted to know if people think that their government responds adequately to the safety needs of LGBTI people. Um, and again, you see significant differences between countries and again, significant differences um, amongst the LGBTI groups. And here it's actually um, uh, significant to see that the gay men and bisexual men uh, actually respond most negatively, that they don't think that their government responds adequately to the safety needs of pe LGBTI people. So this is, uh, that they do, sorry, that they do think the government responds adequately to the safety needs of LGBTI people and the other groups in the LGBTI community lag behind. Um, and as you can see, the EU average with 28%, which is quite low, it's one out of three people think their government responds adequately. But again, uh, I point out the differences, the significant differences between um, the, all the countries surveyed. And lastly, we ask um, uh, in our surveys if the respondents um, often or of, of always avoid holding hands in public with their same sex partner. Um, while holding hands is a, is like a symbol. It's um, uh, people, uh, it's self-evident for many to walk hand in hand with your partner. But as you can see in these figures, um, that is not the case for people with same sex partner. Um, Two out of three people always or often avoid holding hands. And as you can see, again, significant differences between countries, but also within the LGBTI groups where we see gay men and bisexual men actually hesitating the most. So they indicated the most to always or often avoid holding hands in public with a same sex partner. There's something that is self-evident for many in, in our uh, society, but um, for LGBTI people with a same sex partner, this is not the case. Um, we've come to the end of my presentation. As I said, there's a wealth of information on our website. Please go and visit it. We have an interactive data explorer available to cover your own. Uh, you can compile your own report as such uh, on different communities, different questions, different age groups. You can filter for the country. Um, so I would advise you to do so if you are interested in that for advocacy purposes, but also for policymakers on the national level. Uh, it has proven to be very useful. So uh, thank you for my um, for uh, the in attention to my presentation and I will be happy to uh, give the word to um, to give the floor to Irena Musova from the European Commission. Thank you very much, Hul. Hello Copenhagen. Hello everybody, dear activists, community members and also dear allies. So let me first of all take the opportunity and thank the Fundamental Rights Agency and also organizers of Copenhagen 2021 for organizing this very timely discussion. And let me also say that uh, this is very important what Hul just presented. Because when on the European integration. So they build the foundation around a core set of values, including equality and non-discrimination. And these values remain at the heart of the European project. And our goal at the Union uh, of Equality means that there cannot be a second class citizens, but we are building together the Union of Citizens with Equal Rights. And over the years, 
at the European Union, so we have developed a solid set of rules and policies to support equal treatment and protect people who face discrimination. And as a result, we have made progress over the years in advancing acceptance of the LGBTIQ community. But we see that still there is a long way to go for the full LGBTIQ equality. And indeed, so the results, as just presented by Huel, show that the discrimination against LGBTIQ people is seen to be increasing in the European Union. And for LGBTIQ people, it can still be unsafe to show affection in the public, so just a holding hand, to be open about their sexuality or gender identity, or to simply be themselves without fear of discrimination and harassment. And we have also even seen the worrying trends of anti-LGBTIQ incidents, such as attacks on the prides, and oh, we have seen that uh, even in one member state, so the, 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 the municipalities adopted the LGBTI ideology-free zones. And public demonstrations are met with violence, and LGBTIQ civil society organizations increasingly report opposition to their work. And let's be frank, so current COVID-19 health crisis has even amplified these inequalities for LGBTIQ people. Let me mention that confinement has forced many LGBTIQ young people into hostile environments where they are at the risk of violence or increasing levels of anxiety and uh, depression. And some rainbow families faced problems to have documents legally recognized, putting them at risk of being separated when borders close during confinement. So in these uncertain times, we need to pay full attention to the diversity of LGBTIQ people, and in particular those most vulnerable. And this includes, as we have seen in the survey, the trans and intersex people who are among the least accepted groups in society and are at even greater risk of discrimination and violence. Let me confirm that at the European Commission side, so we are building our policies on a long-term commitment. Already in 2015, so we have presented the first policy framework to specifically combat discrimination against LGBTIQ community through the list of actions to advance LGBTI equality. And we will continue to promote LGBTI equality under the first ever LGBTIQ equality strategy that we have adopted last November. For this new strategy, so we want to promote a vision of union of equality for all. And we present the key actions and objectives for the next five years around four pillars. So first, tackling discrimination against LGBTIQ people. Second, ensuring LGBTIQ people's safety. Third, building LGBTIQ inclusive societies. And fourth, leading the call for the LGBTIQ equality around the world. So the first ever LGBTIQ equality strategy sets clear actions and objectives to advance LGBTIQ equality at the European Union, but beyond also its border, but more specifically also at the national level. And we hope it will help to build a union where people in all their diversity are equal, where they can be themselves without risk of discrimination, exclusion or violence. Who already mentioned uh, that the legal framework was very important. So let me be rather clear. So we will not abandon the Equal Treatment Horizontal Directive and try by all means its final adoption. We recognize that the member states, they have a different rules for protecting LGBTIQ people against hate crime and hate speech. In addition, there is no specific European Union level sanction to punish these crimes. So our new Commission strategy proposes to extend the list of the European Union crimes to cover hate crime and hate speech, including when targeted at the LGBTIQ people. And we will also push for mutual recognition of parenthood in the European Union. Because due to the legal differences in the member states, rainbow families still struggle to have their family ties recognized when they cross the European Union's internal borders. And this is not acceptable. And as President von der Leyen stressed in her last year's State of the Union address, if you are a parent in one country, you are a parent in 
tries to advance LGBTIQ equality beyond the European Union borders. This includes, for example, LGBTIQ asylum seekers who are at particular risk of uh, discrimination and violence. And the Commission will insist in appropriate protection of vulnerable applicants, including LGBTIQ, under the reform of a uh, common asylum uh, European system. Now, when implementing the strategy, so we will ensure that civil society organizations, they have a voice in shaping the measures that affect them. We will maintain the structured dialogue with the LGBTIQ organizations, and we will also continue to provide funding to allow them to work without hindrance. And I think that this was also quite documented by the uh, presentation of Hall that this is, those are the most and key important elements in order to support the LGBTIQ equality. We will also organize regular meetings with the member states and take part in the work of the Council of Europe Governmental LGBTIQ uh, Focal Points Network. Let me now stress that we will support uh, future collection of data, equality data by FRA, through the uh, equality data subgroup of the high level group on the non-discrimination equality and diversity, because we strongly believe that reliable and comparable equality data are absolutely crucial for addressing the situation of LGBTIQ people and uh, to effectively actually tackling uh, the inequalities. And one of the messages of the LGBTIQ strategy is uh, indeed that advancing LGBTIQ rights requires a close cooperation between the European institutions and agencies, member states and international organizations. Member states, when I'm speaking about them, so we're speaking about the political level, but also local and municipal level, because it is crucial to have all the actors together with private sector, with social partners, with social, uh, civil society, so they understand and they listen the uh, problems of the LGBTIQ community. So let me thank you all for your commitment towards LGBTIQ equality, because we have to jointly work in order to the, make the dream of the LGBTIQ people to be free who uh, they are, live how they want and love whom they want to love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irena, for your uh, very ambitious words and very committed words of the European Commission. Thank you for that. Uh, and as you said, it's important to have the cooperation at the national level by uh, member states. So I would like to give the floor to Costa Gavrilides, re representing the government of Cyprus. Thank you, Hul. Thank you very much, uh, Irena. It was uh, uh, a very nice uh, um, um, position both from the FRA and from uh, from the um, Commission. It was, uh, thank you very, first of all, uh, Hul, thank you to FRA for um, both uh, the uh, information that you have been providing to the Member States. For us, uh, the information that has been coming from the um, reports of uh, FRA have been very, very helpful in a number of ways. The um, results have been um, mentioned in, during a number of discussions uh, here in a local uh, level, and we have been using them very, very actively, I would say even at the Parliament, when we were discussing a number of um, uh, of laws uh, over the last years. So they have been a very good tool overall and they still are one of the most accurate um, representations of what the LGBTI community locally um, is and how what what their main positions are. Because unfortunately, as a small um, member state, we are not currently in a position to have too much uh, information coming from um, the education sector. So uh, the research that has been done on uh, smaller states, it is indeed very, very uh, difficult. And uh, for, for this reason, I think that the fundamental rights agency position has been very, very, uh, very good. Uh, 
Now, over the years, um, our position here in um, in Cyprus have been uh, helped uh, tremendously, I would say, from um, the progress that we've been doing with the assistance of the Fundamental Rights Agency and the European Union in general, that we've made uh, a good progress uh, over the, um, um, I would say, the last 10 years in uh, 2020. 13 when uh, Cyprus took office um we've um, made some uh, some changes it must be said that uh, we when we when we took office uh, the the uh, Cyprus was ranked uh, literally last out of the um, EU 27 uh, states and it was uh, 40th out of all European uh, countries on the Ilga Europe uh, index. There has been a quite positive gradual improvement and we are now are on the 19th uh, in uh, the EU and the 20, 29th out of uh, all the European countries, which is still means that we have a long way to go. But uh, at least we have been making uh, making progress. Unfortunately, 2020 has not been a good year for, uh, for us. It has been uh, a year where COVID has taken on uh, with all the legislation that has been uh, taken um, um, place locally. And it has to be said that, that we have uh, been trying to find ways to progress LGBTI rights and this stagnation has not helped um, at all. We had things planned and uh, we um, that clearly had to be postponed and uh, we had to shift the attention. Now, uh, more importantly, over the years, the, um, the legislation that we have managed to, uh, to, to go through uh, was uh, the civil union here in Cyprus. It was enacted in 2015 and it was followed on from a very successful first um, uh, pride that we had here in uh, Cyprus. Now this um, uh, effort coming from the civil society and from the um, uh, government and from the political parties in uh, unison, I would say, over um, during the time that it was uh, it was voted, it was assisted uh, from the discussions that were happening in Brussels as well, and um, it was um, quite helpful to have uh, um, to have very good uh, examples on what other member states were doing at the time. Now, with um, following on from the um, uh, legal gen from from the. Um, uh, from the civil union, the other matters that we we've um, progressed uh, here on was to criminalize the homophobic uh, rhetoric and to give power to the um, to the uh, legislations and the courts of Cyprus to consider homophobic and transphobic uh, motives as uh, aggregated offenses that uh, carry additional penalties. Now, for um, moving on, we have the legal gender recognition to be our uh, biggest priorities, a discussion that we've been having here in Cyprus, and that we have been assisted both from our EU uh, uh, partners in a number of uh, fora, but um, uh, primarily through the Council of Europe as well and the uh, Focal Points Network. We've, um, we have drafted um, a, a bill that is now at the final stages, and we're looking forward to having that take into the parliament within the next uh, within the next 12 uh, months. Now, as a co-chair of the um, Focal Points Network, Cyprus has um, has uh, worked together closely together with the UK uh, for the uh, for the last six months in preparing the the work for uh, this uh, co-chairmanship. And I'm uh, happy to say that we're now in the process of discussing a memorandum of understanding a memorandum of understanding also with the European uh, with the UK uh, in a number of areas to progress LGBTI rights um, both uh, in Europe and uh, further on it has um, been assisted um, overall by by our um, very good friends in 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 Brussels as well and uh, I think that um, it is important that uh, we can now clearly look forward to finalizing uh, all these uh, steps. Uh, the government is uh, committed to promoting initiatives uh, to safeguard 
the rights uh, to private uh, life as well, private and family life. And it, um, this clearly involves same-sex families here in Cyprus as well. The public discourse has started about whether or not we can have full acceptance on uh, them um, marriage here in, um, in Cyprus. It's uh, moving on from a civil union. It seems to be the next natural step. And we're now looking also at the rights for adoptive um, um, adopted uh, children. It is a discussion that has um, that needs to be to take place, and it uh, is good that we have um, um, the next steps in this uh, being um, uh, being progressed in the education, and uh, it's um, a conversation that um, that needs to happen. It's um, something that we're looking forward to together with also. Um, other areas such as the con conversion therapies, for example. Um, more importantly, we do need to see how the LGBTI people uh, can reach their full uh, potential in other areas, in the areas of uh, education, in the areas of uh, the workplace. For the workplace, we are looking on uh, drafting new um, guidelines that will uh, involve the the private sector as well, together with the, with, um, uh, the public sector. The path to acceptance in general uh, clearly goes through um, the the working lives of uh, people, and um, the uh, we are very happy that uh, now with the Council of Europe we are also drafting, uh, planning together the uh, the, the next. Uh, launching of uh, guidelines from the Council of Europe uh, itself as uh, part of the focal points network. Now, um, I am generally uh, looking forward to have the the, the next steps in uh, for the next year. We do need to find a way to move out of this uh, COVID period and uh, we do need to, uh, we, we, sh we should stop taking COVID as being the, the big excuse, let's say, about uh, things not happening. We have uh, 2020 that really stagnated the the rights of the LGBTI, the legal rights of the LGBTI, but uh, now we, uh, we need to move on. I'm uh, very uh, happy that we will be welcoming here the next Idaho in Cyprus together with um, uh, the UK. We're hosting this in uh, Nicosia next uh, May. And by then I'm, I'm uh, sure that we will be able to have certain steps in the right direction being made. Malta for us is uh, always a very good uh, example as a member state that we we share a common uh, um, uh, very uh, common elements and uh, we do anticipate that there will be quite uh, uh, quite a big assistance from uh, from them in the next uh, year well thank you very much for this uh, whole thank you very much for uh, to the fra and uh, to the european commission about uh, their own strategy which is uh, clearly a very good uh, step forward for, for all the members Thank you very much, Costa, for your inspiring story, for the, the big ambitions of a small country, as you said yourself. And um, very good to, to know that you're also working closely with civil society, uh, that we have the next representative, Jela, Jelena Kolakovic from the Montenegro uh, NGO Juventus, uh, who will share her experiences with um, LGBTI equality as an activist on the ground level. Jelena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's a big deal for an organization from a small country like ours to be able to present its work and uh, in this important event. So I thank the organizers for inviting Juventus to be able to present what we did so far. I mean, the story about the LGBTI activism in, in Montenegro is fairly, I would say, new. It lasts only since 2009, 2010. But still, you know, certain issues that we uh, were um, able to solve and also the, the, um, the progress that we made, I think it's really, it can be a regional example, I would say, without being uh, pretentious. Um, I have to uh, tell you that the LGBTI uh, EU survey that you presented, but also 
the EU strategy definitely are uh, the documents that we can uh, use in our advocacy efforts. And I see that the uh, some of our advocacy efforts that we uh, were um, primarily promoting in 2020 uh, have been leaning uh, on, on what you actually uh, found on an EU, but also in Macedonia and, and uh, Serbia level. Uh, in terms of the survey of the people that uh, the, the the overall work concerns, but also on the EU LGBTI strategy, because uh, everything that we've done is basically what Irena was uh, was saying. It was really important for us to have this perspective in order to um, in order to focus more or even um, um, overcome the obstacles that have been uh, upon us after uh, August 2020, especially because we had a major political change. In certain ways, this political change was not, um, I would say, uh, without obstacles, especially because uh, we um, saw one a bit of a radical political structure coming to power in Montenegro that uh, for many, many years already actually was quite <clears throat> sorry, against the human rights of LGBTI people uh, in our country. So we thought it would be a good idea to join, for, join forces. So uh, with other organizations that are doing the work in Montenegro, so we created um, a tool, an advocacy tool, which we called the Joint Pla Action Platform. Uh, which was made by five organizations from Montenegro. And um, we gave the new 42nd government uh, of Montenegro a set of measures that we would like to see um, being implemented in our country. So the Joint Action Platform was launched in September 2020. Um, but before this, I have to say that uh, our 2020, uh, although being the COVID-19 year, uh, was the also the year where when we uh, adopted the same-sex partnership law or the the law on life partnership of same-sex persons. It was adopted in July 1st in 2020 and uh, came into action in on July 15th, 2020. And yesterday, um, a year after uh, the implementation of the law started, but uh, we cannot say it was the major uh, the major event for us, especially because this particular implementation of this law is going to be <clears throat> a bit slowed down, especially because other laws that have to be amended in order for the life partnership law to function haven't been brought to um, uh, Parliament's attention or even adopted. So we will have to do a lot of work still in Montenegro in order to actually, for our couples to be able to enjoy their family rights properly. So the joint action platform that I was speaking about before was launched in September 2020 in cooperation with five civil society organizations, that's uh, Juventus, is, which is my organization, LGTI Association, Queer Montenegro, Association Spectra, the Association of LBTQ Women, Stana, and the Montenegrin Harm Reduction Network uh, link. Uh, the platform was created during a series of meeting, uh, meetings involving over 20 activists who discussed several issues uh, related to human rights with special reference to gender equality with an intersectional approach, education, health, labor and social protection, media and media literacy, youth and public administration through the prism of uh, crucial needs of the target groups our organizations work with and the LGBTIQ community is one of them. The activists who have contributed to this platform have, uh, after many years of work in all the, of these areas, developed clear and straightforward requirements on how to improve the quality of life of all our target groups, as well as the general context in which civil society organizations conduct their activities in a way which is meaningful and effective in uh, the Montenegrin context. This is something that we've done before. So it, it was not a new strategy that we developed. It was done before during the previous mandates of the government of Montenegro. And it was 
this particular strategy was to draw attention to basic human rights of the communities we work with and for and give um, suggestions of substantial solutions to improve their position in our society. This time we considered it our duty and our mission to phrase these uh, requirements, which are above all realistically feasible for the new, at that point, 42nd government of Montenegro, and we were fully aware of the aspect of the of all the aspects of the Montenegrin social and cultural reality that we live and uh, work in. Um, in addition to the fact that these requirements are primarily aligned with the need and well-being of uh, our communities, uh, they are also based upon our values and work principles that we are unconditionally guided by. Expertise and competence, compliance with legal norms, ethical postulates, professional and moder modern standards, respect for scientific knowledge and consensus, respect for the autonomy of the other and the different, respect and appreciation of diversity, confidentiality, non-directiveness, reasonableness, systematicity, con consistency, focus, and expediency. So, and the goal of the platform was to contribute to the answer uh, to the question, what kind of society we want to live in, especially because, you know, in Montenegro back in uh, 20, uh, 2019 and 2020, the context was being uh, highly radicalized and the uh, radical structures have been, uh, I would say, um, uh, gaining power. So the, um, this was an extremely important document for us because it was a kind of a vision of the future uh, of Montenegro and the environment we strive for. And it was important for us to kind of give uh, the, uh, the uh, perspective of the citizens, uh, us, uh, to the 42nd government of Montenegro. Uh, and we said that we want a democratic, anti-fascist, secular society of social justice. I mean, these words seem big and these words seem um, a bit, you know, um, I would say in many occasions, something that uh, we kind of, uh, well, that's uh, common knowledge. But um, it's not. Unfortunately, we see in a radicalized context the decrease of respect, and I'm intentionally not saying tolerance because tolerance is an oppressive concept, uh, but saying decrease in respect. And one of the uh, one of the researches that we done uh, at the end of 2019 showed that actually respect towards the LGBTI community in Montenegro decreases with the decrease of of you know um, negative. Uh, stances and um, negative discourses in the country that are promoting hate towards any difference, literally. So um, with this platform that we made, this document was presented uh, in, in uh, February 2020. So between September and February, we had the possibility to uh, create a good working document that we presented to the government and we sat down together in February 2020. Unfortunately, I don't think that they actually, um, that our government appreciated the document much. But still, we do think that this particular document, which is leaning on the EU LGBTI strategy and many other uh, and many other documents, legal and strategical, as far as our country national uh, documents are concerned, um, is something that we won't back down. You know, it's something that we won't back down in in uh, in promoting and in in uh, trying to kind of advocate for, especially. And I'm saying this because. At the moment, we are uh, also facing uh, different issues which are related to social and health protection. We saw that COVID-19 also uh, further on uh, stigmatized and discriminated on many, uh, many um, communities, including the LGBTI community that were before COVID-19 also in a disadvantaged position. So we really feel that this particular document, but also all the other that we plan on using in our further work, 
will be something that um, will uh, serve as a guiding tool and as I said, advocacy tool that uh, we need to um, implement furthermore or that we need to, um, I would say, um, emphasize in our work, especially because we wanted to, with this joint action to motivate our government to actually engage in a joint conversation, especially when we speak about human rights of LGBTI people that have been you know, a part of the uh, a part of the um, discussion that wasn't so um, welcomed in our country, but not only in our country, but also in our region. Um, as you Thank said, you yeah, very okay. much. I, I think oh, could you round off because I'm looking at the clock and we're yes, about to go into the live course. part of this uh, session. Of course, I mean, it's it's really important to kind of um, uh, say that, 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 that the things that you've mentioned in the EU LGBTI survey, which are related to political will, but also po political negative stances and discourses that are influencing the increase in intolerance and increase in prejudices in, uh, and violence is definitely something that has been reflected in our country. And we plan on working additionally on that particular way in, in, in a way to um, include uh, political parties in a conversation and we won't back down. Thank you very much, Jelena, for your inspiring words and the hard work that you do, even uh, in difficult circumstances. Sometimes we know that activists do their work and civil society is crucial for having the implementation of uh, and respecting and equality of LGBTI people all over uh, the EU. Um, Irena, Costa and Jelena, thank you very much for being part of this session. Um, uh, we hope to meet again in person someday uh, again. And um, oh, until then, we will, we will, with the magic wand, switch over now to the uh, 30 minutes uh, live discussion that we'll have with you as an audience, uh, uh, answering to all your questions. And uh, please stay with us and um, keep up the good work for all of us and all of you. So uh, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you.